The title of this presentation is Flip Teaching, the whole picture. And as you look at this really chicken scratch, horrible handwriting, um, for you watching this for the first time, this might be a little um, distracting, but if you're one of my students, the native teacher-produced handwriting um, is something you get used to and actually decrease your overall cognitive load of the information. And that's something that we're going to talk about in this presentation. That website up there contains all the resources for this presentation, um, including additional sources that were not talked about. Feel free to email me or call me if you have any questions or hit any roadblocks. So my story started off in the classroom with a smart board, um, moved on to a tablet PC because I wanted more mobility and the ability to record screencasts um, on the go or at my house. Um, then I wanted to move to a Mac-based system, but there was no tablet PC, and I discovered these tablet slates made by Wacom. The one here is the Graphire, that's a wireless, and here's the Bamboo. Um, we'll talk about pricing later on in this presentation. When I realized that I could use these to then use the screencast software on the computer, um, I no longer was wedded to any single device, and I could plug this into a Mac or PC environment, and the real-time handwriting and very sensitive um, pen made originally for digital artists helped improve the authenticity of the instruction online. So really, really like it. Slight learning curve, but that's how I got to where I am using the tools that I do today. Um, this quote, I think, really provides a nice over overarching theme or idea for this presentation. Farbud Nevi, um, CEO of the test prep startup Rocket.com said, the problem with education is not one of engineering, but one of design. And I think what Farb is getting at here is this idea that we have available tools. Today in 2011, there's probably um, an over-emergence of tools. But what really needs to catch up is the pedagogy or the design, that space where classroom instruction and tools overlaps. So we're going to look at this through that window. Um, and I think it's especially fitting given that this is a Google workshop and a YouTube workshop, and we're going to be talking about resources a lot. It's a good idea to keep that pedagogy um, at or exceeding the lens for which we look at resources. So the four lenses that we're going to look at in this presentation one, the research, and that's in an area called cognitive load. Um, out of the research will come an intervention. I'm going to call that tab casting, and that's simply what you saw in the introduction slide, the screen casting of tablet annotations. Somewhat of a cheesy buzzword, but I think it's easier than saying screen casting with a tablet device. Um, the design, which will come out of the intervention, we're going to call flip teaching. Another buzzword, we're going to demystify that and talk about how all-encompassing it is. And the production. You want to be left after this presentation being able to go and do this on any platform, whether it be a Mac, PC, strictly online tools, or your iPad. So let's look at the research, cognitive load. Um, I find the education, I think it don't matter where you go to school, Italy, America, Brazil, it's all of the same. It's all just memorization. And it don't matter how long you can remember anything, just so you can pair it back for the test. And I got this idea for a school I would like to start. Something called the five minute university. <laughs> and the idea is that in five minutes, you learn what the average college graduate remembers five years after he or she's out of school. Wouldn't it cost like $20? <laughs> that might seem like a lot of money, $20 just for five minutes. But that's for like a tuition, <laughs> capping and gown rental, graduation picture, snacks, everything. Everything included. So what fascinates me most, and I apologize I jumped into this without um, giving you some introduction, but this is an old SNL skit by a man named Father Guido Sarducci. And... Although really hilarious, what fascinates me most about this clip is the quick applause after Father describes the intricacies of the five-minute university. Almost like everybody in the audience could empathize with this. So I think this is an issue, and I it, rather 
than speaking more to simple things like memorizing information or not memorizing information. It speaks to not looking at instruction through a lens of student cognition. So if we look at the brain, and I know the brain is a very dynamic space, but let's look at this one model. Um, and this one model, developed by a man named Alan Badley and further expanded by John Sweller and Richard Mayer at UC Santa Barbara, looks at our brain as two compartments. One, the working memory, where things are processed live, and the long-term memory, where schema is formed. Things are coordinated into multiple elements. Um, and as schemas formed, information you learn then is easier the second time you hear it. We have these dual channels, information going through the eyes or the ears. Um, but if the information is too hard, um, we can form what's called intrinsic load. Things like calculus and AP chemistry are just harder than other subjects for some students. Also, we can look at the environment. If the environment is cluttered, um, the teacher isn't using resources appropriately, um, there's not enough white space on paper, a myriad of different things, we can have what's called extraneous load. And if the intrinsic and extraneous load are too high, we can have what's called cognitive overload. And if that occurs, this information can't get in. So the purpose of the instructor, one of the major purposes of the instructor is to minimize the intrinsic load and minimize the extraneous load without sacrificing meaningful learning. If that happens, information can go into the working memory, coordinated, chunked, formed into schema, learned again, it's easier the second time. And when that happens, a student learns, basically. And when looking at it through this lens, there's many ways we can adjust or manage that cognitive load. My um, dissertation in college was titled The Effects of Using Screencasting as a Multimedia Pre-Training Tool to Manage the Intrinsic Cognitive Load of Chemical Equilibrium for Instruction for Advanced High School Chemistry Students. Blech. That's a mouthful. Basically, what it's saying is that chemistry is hard for students, specifically chemical equilibrium. So what I did was expose students to brief pre-training screencasts, which tricked them into having this interaction okay, and forming some prior knowledge before they experienced the live lesson in class. So they entered class with some prior knowledge, and that subsequently decreased that intrinsic load allowing the information to be easier to learn for the students. They will learn the same information as others, but they came to the page with a little bit of prior knowledge, so that was important. Um, what comes out of this is the intervention I'm going to call tab casting. So if you look at this problem, this is out of the world of chemistry by Zumdahl. This problem is a typical worked example you'd see in a chemistry textbook. This was actually taken out of the last chapter I taught last year. It's really nice. It gives the, um, the problem up here, then it gives a solution, outlines the variables, shows students the equations, even shows them how to rearrange the equation and come at the answer. Okay, but there's some problems with this. The first major problem is all the information is given to you at once. Okay. The second major problem, if you reflect back onto our model here, is all the information is going in through the eyes. So what we're getting is cognitive overload when we look at it through this lens. Now I've got to go through this. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 blah. blah. Okay. So let's look at this exact same problem following this exact same solution using a tabcast this gas problem straight out of your textbook. So in this problem it says you have a sample of hydrogen gas with a volume of 8.56 liters, a temperature of 0 degrees Celsius, and a pressure of 1.5 atmospheres. And it's asking you to calculate the moles and we're talking about hydrogen gas here. So let's first just go ahead and list everything that's given before we decide on the equation we're going to be using. And from atmospheres, the volume was 8 point arc moles of H2, because that's what we're looking for here. All right, so now let's decide on the equation we're going to use. So now we're going to rearrange this equation for N. So RT on this side, RT. Right, so we're ready to plug it in. Let's go through and make all the units are correct. Pressure is supposed to be in atmospheres. Well then, 
So we're gonna, a really common thing is to be for grams instead of moles, and we do a simple mole conversion to get grams. We're gonna keep all the units alive, so you see the volume we know is atmosphere is liters over moles. Let's go through and look at the units just to prove to ourselves that we end up with moles. Atmosphere with just moles left, five, seven moles of hydrogen gas. Okay, so notice in this video, let's talk about the different ways which this managed the cognitive load versus that one text-only worked example. Okay, so remember we have this working memory live processing box. The information that a subject presents takes up some space. We'll call that the intrinsic cognitive load. And the environment that that information is couched in takes up some working memory space. We'll call that the extraneous cognitive load. Um, so in that video right there, I was able to offload text, meaning some things I said and some things I wrote, unlike the other example where everything was written. Okay? I actually said some things that there's no way I could have written down, which allowed me to maximize both channels. I went off, gave some examples. Um, so in addition to the stuff that was in the text-based work example, by utilizing both channels of the working memory, I was able to provide the students with more information and less cognitive load. I was able to chunk the material. You did not see it all at once. You saw it presented to yourself in segments. Um, I also could use a video like this for pre-training like I spoke of earlier. Um, all of those three things are research-based mechanisms to actually decrease information complexity. You're not sacrificing the content the way you are presenting it overlaps well with the architecture of the working memory, thus maximizing um, working memory space. Um, if this was posted online, the user could interact with it, rewind it without the teacher getting annoyed, play it over and over. It would be cataloged. Um, because it was my native handwriting and my voice, students formed what's called social agency with the video. It was personalized. That also decreases extraneous cognitive load. And I was able to direct their attention. I could move the mouse cursor around and underline certain things. Okay. So the exact same worked example done in a tabcast format. And the reason I'm going to talk about tabcasting versus native video per se is that it doesn't involve my face, my body. It involves only the essential information. The handwriting and the voice and the information and whatever you have on screen. That's all that is needed. So once we looked at the research, the intervention that came out of the research, those are still just tools. We need to couch those in a design infrastructure. So let's look at a video that came out earlier this year where flip teaching was popularly announced, although it's been on the grassroots level specifically out of Colorado and two teachers named Aaron Sams and John Bergman um, were some of the initial founders of using tabcasting for this idea of flip teaching or reverse instruction. So here's a TED talk or an excerpt of a TED talk by Salman Khan of the Khan Academy. But I didn't think it would be something that would somehow penetrate the classroom. But then I started getting letters from teachers and the teachers would write saying, we've used your videos to flip the classroom. You've given the lectures. So now what we do, and this could actually happen in every classroom in America tomorrow, what I do is I assign the lectures for homework. So I'm gonna pause it here for a second. This is what got Khan in trouble on the educational tech and just teaching blogosphere. Um, because he is not a teacher, actually, he's very open about the fact he used to work for a hedge fund. He's still operating from the same paradigm that teachers are lecturing in class. And I know that's true a lot of places in the country, but people at TED Talks, people reading ed blogs are cutting edge educa educators for the most part. And they're trying to implement more constructivist, specifically physics teachers, um, modeling activities where students can form their own knowledge and work with one another, work online. And it's not that typical sage on a stage. Khan is operating from the assumption that that's how school works, and I think that got him in trouble um, with some people who were opponents of the Khan Academy. And what used to be homework, I now have the students doing in the classroom. And I want to I want to pause here for. I, I want to pause here for a second because there's a couple of interesting things. One, when those when those teachers are doing that. 
there's there's the obvious benefit. There's the the benefit that now their their students can enjoy the videos in the way that my cousins did. They can pause, repeat at their own pace, uh, at their own time. But the more interesting thing, and this is the unintuitive thing when you talk about technology in the classroom. By removing the one size fits all lecture from the classroom and letting and letting students have a self paced lecture at home. And then when you go to the classroom, letting them do work, having the, the teacher walk around, having the peers actually be able to interact with each other, these teachers have used technology to humanize the classroom. They took a fundamentally dehumanizing experience, a bunch of th 30 kids with their fingers on their lips, not allowed to interact with each other. A teacher, no matter how good, has to give this kind of one-size-fits-all lecture to 30 students, you know, blank faces, slightly antagonistic. And now it's a human experience. Now they're actually interacting with each other. So while Khan makes an amazing point, specifically the idea of classroom time freed up for students to work with with one another and teachers to work with students in that way that we really yearn to, that one-on-one -on -one interaction with students because class time is not now occupied by this lecture. And also homework becomes more meaningful because it's now this plugged in direct instruction versus copying one another in the hallway. Um, I think this oversimplified what flipped teaching was and in some ways gave it a bad name. So here's the definition that I would like to propose. Using native teacher produced video to shift any form of instruction from the classroom to the homework setting. So again, native teacher produced. This would somewhat um, say that I'm against teachers using the Khan Academy, and I'm not. I think the Khan Academy is an amazing resource, one, for teacher professional development, two, for student um, amplification of stuff that they might not have gotten in class. But I think if a teacher truly wants to flip his or her own classroom, Looking at it through a lens of cognitive load, we need that personalization effect. Okay. Um, and then I say any form of instruction. So this doesn't mean that it has to be what happens as quote-unquote lecture, but things like homework review. Okay, What if a teacher is assigning problems for homework and they need that 15 minutes in class and don't want to go over it in class? Test review. Okay, And a myriad of many, 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 many different things that a teacher can offload to the homework setting. It doesn't have to be that the whole class was lecture and now that's shifted to homework. Okay? So part of our job in this presentation and throughout this week is going to be deconstructing what that really means, what are different ways that this overlaps with your class. Even if you're a, say, a modeling teacher in physics and you are completely against lecture, there are some things that can be shifted. If you look hard, there are some moments of fact-based direct instruction or test review, et cetera, that might better might be better served if they were cataloged for students. Um, I think this idea of flip teaching is really alluded to in Dan Pink's book Drive when he says, with a little thought and effort, we can turn homework into home learning. And this is really what the cognitive load approach is looking at. How can we achieve meaningful learning, which, which would then subsequently um, inspire purpose and motivation with students. So let's look at some design, flip teaching design um, models that transcend the simple definition that Khan gave in his TED talk. So when I surveyed some teachers a couple of years ago, this was the standard class design and I'm, I'm talking mainly about science and math instruction, although I know that uh, many of you teach other subjects and look at your class through a different lens. But let's just assume that this is a standard class design. Warm up five minutes, we got 15 minutes for homework review, direct instruction or inquiry based learning, however the students are going to get the material about 30 minutes and hopefully 10 minutes at the end of class for practice. So in the traditional flipped model, um, well first let's look at where does the most meaningful learning occur and it turns out in the research the most meaningful learning, sorry about that, the most meaningful learning is really going to occur here in the warm-up period where students form connections from the previous day and get to practice, and here at the end of the period where they're now applying what they learned. So basically, you could consolidate that to the word practice, and when the students are practicing, what's happening is that information is going back and forth between the working and long-term memory and the forming schema. So there is a time allocation issue here. Only 15, maybe 15 to 10 minutes is being allocated towards the most meaningful part of class. Homework review, not everybody needs it. 
instruction. Direct instruction is a very passive form of learning and also if it's not cataloged and online, students get it once and then it's gone. So the traditional flip model offloads that instruction piece to tabcasted homework and fills in the remaining space with practice. And we look at this as the traditional flip design, sort of what Khan was talking about in his lesson. Um, what I'm doing in my class is harnessing a method designed by a physics teacher named Carplus in the um, early 70s. And Carplus's learning cycle was explore, explain, apply. And what I did here is just substitute that word explain for flip, meaning the explanation happens, but it's via um, tabcasted videos at home. So the first part of the day, students, or the first day or first portion of the week, students spend time exploring going through inquiry activities. And this is really great in the sciences because students are coming to the table with a lot of prior knowledge. They've lived in the subject their whole life. So that prior knowledge needs to be explored and it needs to be um, deconstructed and demystified. Then homework that night, students go home and watch a flipped lesson. And when I say flipped, they're watching the explanation piece of Carplus's learning cycle for homework. And that explanation cycle is going to give them some now rudimentary information, some core concepts, and hopefully demystify anything that any questions that were left after the exploration open-ended lab portion of the day. Um, and then they'll come to class the next day and apply those concepts. So they will do practice problems if it's an AP class, free response items. Um, if it's a regular chemistry class, we'll work through um, various real life examples. This is where group work will occur. This is where classroom competitions will happen, um, quizzes, etc. So notice no class time was used for the explanation of core concepts. Class time was used to activate prior knowledge and class time was used for application via just switching that explain piece of design with more of a flipped model. So there's the flip portion. Um, this is just a little silent video of that. Day one students are exploring. In this case, they're looking at behavior of gases in those test tubes. For homework, they're going to explain it. So you see a student here watching um, one of my lessons. And I'm going to talk later about the importance of embedding a Google form below the lesson. But the student here is, is watching this and chunking it by going through and subsequently filling out this summary box that I've embedded below the video. That's how I assess students on the video. So notice there going through here and he or she is filling out this summary according to a summary rubric we have. Um, watching the video in a real meaningful way, stopping it, rewinding it, and adjusting their summary accordingly. Um, so they're getting that core concepts that related to the exploration the day before. And as they go through this summary, They'll hit submit. That'll go into a Google form or Google Docs spreadsheet where I will then go read those. The next day, students are going to come to class. They've watched the video and the summary. And we're going to do the application piece of Carpus' cycle. To start off class, I'm going to go to Google Docs and grab all of their responses, read them. I'm going to copy and paste them and throw them into a word cloud generator. Wordle's a great one. And that's going to really bring out the most commonly used words. It's also going to show words that are large that shouldn't be large. And it's going to be a nice interactive way to have a Q&A about the lesson. So while it's not direct instruction, we do we don't want to leave students with a lot of questions. And then the rest of the period, they're going to go through the application process. Here are students now taking some information from their lab and expanding it with some questions we did in class. Other ideas are the pre-training model I talked about, where you show students quick, quick, three to five minute videos, tricking them into having prior knowledge for homework. And they come to class with a little bit of experience and more confidence, thus decreasing cognitive load. Um, homework solutions. We saw earlier that 15 minutes is usually allocated towards review of homework in a standard science classroom. What if homework was not reviewed in class, but it was cataloged on, say, a YouTube channel? Um, that way, students, I heard this quote once that said, 50% of students do not need you to go over homework. 50% of them need you to go over it once. If you go over homework in class, you're not reaching anybody. So this way, the students who need it more than once have a catalog, and the students who don't need it now have that extra 15 minutes in class. It's not what Khan was talking about, but it is a form of flipped instruction. 
in English. I've seen teachers do live essay grading or assigning a good, medium, and poor essay it's graded online for students to watch and comment on. That way, instead of students getting, say, a paper all marked in red, they get a paper back that um, has a private YouTube link that goes along with it where they can watch the grading happen. And throughout this talk, we're going to stop and reflect on other ideas because this is a recording. We can't do that here right now. Um, so let's talk about the specifics. You need to be left. We talked about the research. We talked about the design, but it's really that intervention, that tab casting intervention. Um, although it's a tool, it's what's going to allow everything else to come together. So let's talk about the specifics and let's talk about them on multiple platforms. So what we did here in the in the talk, although this is recorded, is we went to my AP Chemistry site and we looked at the website and I had you guys count how many steps I had to go through to get that embedded tab cast there with the form below it. And it turns out that the first thing we needed was a tablet device. Second thing we need is the ability to write. And this is a very, very underrated piece. If you have the tablet hardware, it doesn't mean that you can write on your screen. You need some sort of pen tool device built into a PDF annotator, PowerPoint, etc., that allows you to write over the screen. After that, you need to record your writing, and that's going to be published. After that, you need some sort of tracking device. Now, remember when you were watching that video earlier, you saw the student filling out that Google form below. You need a tracking device so that students feel accountable for watching the video and you build in a simultaneous reflection. And then it just needs to be shared. So let's look at this. Well, first, I'm going to highlight the writing. The writing piece turns out to be the hardest piece, so really focus on that through the con through the course of the presentation today and the tracking piece ends up being really really important so I put a big summary box below as a, as a Google form summary text box below the video and ask students to write a five sentence summary and you could pause this and read um, this rubric but this is what students do on every one and I know that if they do this when watching the video they at least spent some time being an active participant in watching the video. So although I might only give them a five minute explanation video for homework, I know if they went through this process, they had to reflect on what they understood and what they didn't. Therefore, there was metacognition activated. They had to then apply it to the real world. So I thought that was a really, really nice addition. And it's really changed that application time in class. Students come to class having already thought about real world examples. Okay, so let's back up. When we're talking about writing, there's really two types of writing. One, over, and two, in. And when I say over and in, writing over the screen, I mean, say, let's say you're standing behind a glass mirror and somebody writes all over your face and you move. Okay. Initially, it looked like they circled or wrote on your face. However, what happened in reality was that they wrote on the window versus in if somebody scribbles on your face directly no matter where you go that writing stays and now there's times when you're going to want to write over and there's times when you're going to want to write in so i'm going to do a demo writing over using a program called omnidazzle and writing in using a pdf program called formulate pro now i'm using a mac right now and the website flipteaching.com lists tons of resources for you to do that on the pc platform this demo will just be in a Mac. Okay. So Omnidazzle, which you see right down there, um, allows me to write over the screen. So with a, some quick pen strokes, it brings up my pen tool. Okay, I can switch colors. Okay, I can erase it by shaking it. I can open up Keynote. I can write over my keynote presentation, shake it, it erases. But notice that if I move things, the writing stays right there. So that's what I mean by writing over. I'm not writing on the document. I'm writing over an, an invisible screen. And that's really, really nice for writing over keynote, which unlike PowerPoint does not have a pen tool built in. It's also nice for writing over things like a video. Or, now, my favorite thing is actually writing in PDF documents. So let's take 
um, PDF I got here and let's drag it into Formulate Pro. There it is and it opens up here in Formulate Pro. First off, I like it. Here's that rubric we, we saw earlier because you can zoom in. Also, the majority of documents students have are PDF documents or Word documents. Therefore, you can work through worksheets with students in class and what you annotate is very similar to what they are holding. Thus, again, extraneous cognitive load is going to be decreased. I'm going to get my pen tool here. Now I'm writing in the document. And now notice when I move, the annotation stays with it. Okay. I can then save this and post it on the website. I can change colors. I can print this um, out for students. So this is writing in versus writing over. And personally, I think writing in, if you're going to choose one way, is by far the most useful. If you want a blank screen, you can always just drag a blank PDF in there and write. Um, and you can then again go look at this on other platforms other than just simply the Mac platform, although that's the demonstration that I just did. In terms of screencasting, now the ability to record the annotations of the tabcast, you have a simple screencast, um, and then you have screencasting software with an editing environment. Very, very similar. One just simply records the screen and gives you a video. The other records it and opens it up in something like iMovie or Formulate Pro. Now it's not those, but it has its own editing environment. And that's more useful if you want to then backtrack and add other forms of media, etc. Um, and then there's online programs which have the screencasting ability built directly into the internet. Um, so I'm going to do a demo of the simple one, Jing and some with editing, ScreenFlow. And I'm not going to do the demo of the online, but Screencast-O-Matic is a great one for online, primarily because it does not have a time limit. And there is a pro account which allows for HD embedding um, and editing as well. Again, I'm doing this on a Mac platform, although Jing is a cross-platform program. And it, you can go again to flipteaching.com and see that Camtasia Studio is a great program for editing on a PC. So, Jing lives up here in the corner of your computer. Pull it up. I choose the part of the screen I want to record. I hit this capture video button. It counts down. I do my recording. I do my annotating using in or over annotation. I finish the recording. It gives me a little area right here to name the video. I can then also upload it directly to YouTube. Notice it didn't open it in an editing environment. I do my recording. I do my annotating using in or over annotation. At all now, I can also upload it, do it in Screencast, ScreenFlow. This is more of a complex one. And that's what I'm recording right now. So I'm not going to show you that, but what would happen is that's what I'm using to record this talk right now. So what you'll notice in that is that it's going to open everything up in an editing environment where then you can go and backtrack and unlike what you just saw with Jing, do some actual simple editing. So I noted earlier that the first thing you need is a tablet device. Second, you need to figure out what in and over annotation software you need. See flipteaching.com for various platform-based programs. We talked about the different screencast options. That would be the simple one, like Jing, with no editing environment, and something like ScreenFlow that opens it up in an editing environment. All of those will allow for one button upload options to YouTube. So we didn't add that publish feature as its own step because it's always incorporated within the screencasting software. I noted that it's very important to track whether or not students watch the video. And then we got to share, okay? And that's gonna be via your own personal Google site website, Moodle, etc. Um, the tracking, sharing, publishing, that's all fairly self-explanatory. So now that we've talked about screencasting, what we want to do now is talk about this flow of events on various different platforms with respect to what I recommend. And I want to start this off by saying these are purely my recommendations. Flipteaching.com lists many other resources as well as other websites online that you can find links to on the home page, bottom right corner of flipteaching.com. So let's look at this from a platform lens. On a Mac platform, recommend the Bamboo tablet. Very cheap, very easy to use. Um, in terms of annotation, 
recommend Jarnall or Formulate Pro for PDF annotation. Jarnall is great because you can access different colors very easily. Formulate Pro is great for in-class annotation because it's extremely easy to drag and drop PDFs in and zoom in for student access. I recommend ScreenFlow for your screencasting software. Very, very good Mac-based program. Opens up in an editing environment. One button, upload to YouTube. Publish directly to YouTube. You can have HD embedding if you export your screen flow as 100%. Um, recommend using Google Docs, the Google Forms specifically, as the tracking device and publishing directly to Google Sites, which will allow for easy, easy embedding of the YouTube video and the Google Form. On a PC platform, again, the Bamboo is great because it's multi platform, easy to use. Recommend a program called Zornal. Open source, much like Jarnall, works in a very similar way to Jarnall, but only on the PC. Um, or PowerPoint, actually, instead of um, some other over device. PowerPoint has a really, really, really good pen tool if you hover over the bottom left in presentation mode, allowing you to save those annotations directly in PowerPoint. Mac does not have a good PowerPoint annotation tool. Um, so Camtasia Studio is the recommended more complex screencasting software for the PC. Opens it up in an editing environment just like ScreenFlow. Camtasia does make a Mac based software but it's still not as stable as ScreenFlow so I'm not yet recommending the Camtasia Mac over ScreenFlow in the Mac environment. One button upload to YouTube again using Google Docs for the tracking piece and a Google site is what I recommend if you don't have your own personal website online platform. So other than the Bamboo, which I'm recommending up front because it's very easy to use and very cheap, all the rest of the tools I'm going to talk about here can be found online, meaning no software must be downloaded to your computer. Um, Crocodoc, I just found recently, is an excellent PDF annotation device allowing for various colors. I think there's yellow, blue, and red. You can zoom in. You can actually save your annotations. It's really, really great all online. No software must be downloaded. Um, for your screencast, I recommend Screencast-O-Matic over other online functions. Screen R is very popular. Screen Castle, etc. Screen Toaster used to be a real popular one, but it's not around anymore. I recommend Screencast-O-Matic primarily because there is no time limit and a real easy upload directly to YouTube. Um, it also has a pro version. I think it's really cheap, 10 bucks a year or something like that. And it allows for HD embedding as well as an editing environment. So you get a lot of good functionality. I used to not recommend these online tools. However, they're getting real, real good. Again, once you upload to YouTube, you can throw a Google form right below for tracking and your Google site allowing you to integrate your YouTube video from Screencast-O-Matic which captured your Crocodile annotation using your Bamboo right into the Google site. Now if you have an iPad, this used to not be a reality until about a couple months ago. Um, you could use your iPad as the annotation device instead of the Bamboo tablet. And there are a couple new applications. One called Replay Note, the other called Show Me, and one now is coming out from TechSmith. It's not out yet. I really don't know the name, but I know it's coming out. These are the people who make Camtasia Mac and Camtasia Studio. All of these allow for built-in, all-in-one annotation and capturing of those annotations. Now, I'm not saying screencasting because it's not capturing or a recording of your iPad screen. It's basically recording in a specific area your annotations. I recommend using the Bamboo um, a pogo device with the iPad using your finger there's a little bit of a delay and I've tried a bunch of these and I really really like this bamboo device it's made by Wacom the same company that makes the bamboo and it integrates well with the iPad um, out of these three options and I don't know TechSmith yet but out of replay note and show me I really gotta say I like replay note better because it's got one button upload directly to YouTube Show Me keeps everything directly on the Show Me site, and I think they're more associated with Vimeo. So, ReplayNote also allows for import of a PDF document.
an annotation over that. Now show me is getting a lot more press than replay note. However, still I gotta go with replay note. Um, because it's all in one, these include the annotation. So we've skipped that piece. Again, you can take the Google form and since you uploaded it directly to YouTube, you can put it right in your Google site. Something I'm going to experiment this year with my iPad is what I'm going to call on-the-go Q&A. So because the iPad, if you have the 3G or 4G, is directly connected to the Internet, I can be on-the-go, get a question from a student, immediately, say, sitting in my car, respond to it via a tabcast, upload to YouTube, and if that YouTube is connected to a channel students have access to, I'm done. They know to access the channel and we're good to go. So students have a question. They either text me the question or email me the question, something that I can get mobily. I grab my iPad, record in a replay note, upload it to YouTube. As long as it's connected to YouTube and that account is logged in with the same credentials as my channel, students then know to check the YouTube channel within, say, 10, 15 minutes, and they get a nice answer to their question beyond a simple text, something that maximizes that cognitive architecture that we talked about earlier and minimizes cognitive load, plus it's stored on the channel if anyone else has a similar question. Chances are, if it's a question that they reached out to me via text or email, someone else has that question as well. So although this is kind of an extension of the iPad platform and not really directly tied to the definition I showed earlier of flipped teaching, it is a subsequent application and something that's really, 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 I think, going to impact how responses are cataloged and how I communicate with students in a more effective way, again, that overlaps with their cognitive architecture. Now, in terms of the speaker's choice, if I was to pick what I would do on a Mac, here's what I'd do. I'd start off with a Graphire one instead of the Bamboo. I didn't talk about this earlier because it's a little bit more expensive. Wacom doesn't make the Graphire anymore. Um, they make something called the Intuos Wireless, but I like the Graphire better. It has a little place to hold the pen. Um, it's got really, really, really good Bluetooth range. Um, wasn't using it as my main recommendation based on the price, but I'd go with that. It can be mobile in the classroom. I then use Jarnall. It's free. I use Jarnall basically because you can still do everything with Formulate Pro. And if you're not in the classroom, you're recording the screencast at home, the access to the different pen tools is really, really easy, and it's a really nice software program. I then go with ScreenFlow for videos greater than five minutes, and those less than five minutes, I go with Jing. Jing has a five-minute limit, which makes it a great, great intervention for the pre-training that I was talking about earlier, those short pre-training moments to convince students that they have prior knowledge to decrease intrinsic cognitive load. Both of these things can upload directly to YouTube. Again, Google Docs for my forum and Google Sites for the website. Okay, on the PC platform, I'm going to go with the Graphire wireless tablet from Wacom as well. More expensive. Again, this is speaker's choice. I'm going to go with Zornall, very similar to Jarnall. Again, if you have PowerPoint, that works really well on the PC. I always am going to advocate for the PDF annotation piece because what you're writing over really mirrors what the students have in their hands most likely, whether it's a worksheet, etc., decreasing strenuous cognitive load. Um, video greater than five minutes, we're going to go with Camtasia Studio. Less than five minutes, Jing, and both are going to send right out to YouTube. Google Docs for tracking, Google Sites to contain the video. There's some all-in-one options, and when I say all-in-one, I mean that the screencasting, the annotation, the publishing is all built in one, and all you need is that plug-in device. So the second step, which was writing, the third step, which was screencasting, um, all of that's built right in. Online tools, there's something called Sketchcast. It's great, it doesn't involve PDF annotation, and you just have a little box to write in. But again, it's all in one. And on the website, flipteaching.com, if you go to tools and scroll down to online, and then you go down to labs, I've built in a couple that integrates this screencast-o-matic screencaster um, to try and play around with some online options. And then on the iPad, all three of these are all good online, all-in-one, or iPad all-in-one options. I will say with the iPad, I didn't say this earlier, there is a pen delay. You do not see the cursor hovering, and all these things over time can really, really add to um, or decrease the efficiency of the process. So I really think that the answer to using the iPad is for that quick Q&A with students. And the bamboo, because there's no pen delay, it really, really, really looks authentic. 
So I'm hesitant on switching to a pure iPad platform for completely flipping my classroom right now. In terms of cost, PC low cost option, get the Bamboo tablet, Zoranol, Jing or Camtasia Studio or Screencast-O-Matic, YouTube, Google Forms, and Google Sites, you're spending only 69 bucks for the low cost option. There's the high, high cost option on the PC. It's really the Graphire Wireless is where the, the price is coming out of. Links to all of these can be found on flipteaching.com. On the Mac environment, Bamboo Tablet, Jarnall, Formulate Pro, and Omnidazzle, Jing or Screencast-O-Matic, YouTube, Google Forms, Google Sites. Again, $69 only. You're only paying for the tablet. And very similar to the low-cost option, except the um, ScreenFlow, addition of ScreenFlow and the Graphar Wireless tablet increases the cost to $169. I will say that ScreenFlow um, does not include some of the intense functionality of Camtasia Studio, although I think it's much easier to use. So you're going to spend more for Camtasia Studio on the PC, but you're going to get some things like embedded flash quizzing, etc. On the ScreenFlow Mac end, you're going to get much more fluid ease of use, um, but you're not going to get the flash quizzing. You're going to get all the editing features as well. So you're paying more on the PC end for Camtasia Studio. There's an example of what my recording studio at Sacred Heart Cathedral Prep looks like. Just an example of how you can really, really do all of this for under $100. I made this cheap looking recording studio out of cardboard and an egg crate. Works great. Thank you very much.